We've just seen a, a, a tremendous example of what technology can do in terms of changing the lives of thousands of children and in fact changing the culture itself. So it's not just, just what's happening to an individual child but what's happening to the entire country of Uruguay as a result of the work that Saibal is doing under the extraordinary leadership of Miguel. And I, I want to take then this and expand beyond the one country where which, which can serve as a model for all of us in many respects, including to the United States, because you know, Uruguay has gone far beyond the United States in terms of what is possible by the use of technology to transform education, to make it more personalized, more creative, more um, ability to in fact have everyone be both a teacher and a learner, so that the, we're all teachers and learners at the same time. And I want to take this now and expand to the world as a whole. And, uh, and my basic message is here today is that, in fact, more than ever, we as a society require an educated citizenry. This is not an option anymore. We are connected together in a way largely by technology, in a way that has never been possible before and which brings us all together so that we're all in the same boat, in effect. And we need this, and that in fact to do that requires a great deal of creativity, which we've talked about, and courage. Because change is not easy to do. And so it's not simply creativity that we require, new ideas, new ways of handling, of, of dealing with education, but also we need a lot of courage in that process. My thesis is that this just might be possible. Now, some people look at the world today and say, well, what are we dealing with? What is the population we're dealing with? We're doing, of the seven billion people in the world, roughly two billion of us are under the age of 15. And less than 200 million of that, of, those, of, of these children of ours under the age of 15, live in the so-called developed world. And Uruguay is one of those developed countries. It's not an underdeveloped country. So what the Open Learning Exchange is focused on is what happens to that 1.8 billion? What happens to that over 90% of the children in the world under the age of 15? What is their future? What will happen there? And most of these are hungry, uh, have little or no schooling, and the question is what goes on, what will, what will be the possibilities for them? Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in the Congo, and I met with a, a bunch of young children, and Celeste here was one of them. And Celeste came up to me after, after I met with her, and she said, you know, I want to learn. I want to be able to contribute to my community. How can I do that? What, what can I do, she asked me. What can, I, what can she do to make this happen? And you could see looking right into her eyes, and I took, her, took a picture, I wanted to have that in my own mind as I thought, we need a better answer for Celeste and for the 1.8 billion people. Now Celeste is in a school that has no electricity, no plumbing. Comes to school, two thirds of the month she comes to school without having breakfast, because her parents get paid on the first of the month, she gets breakfast for 10 days, and then no breakfast for the rest of the month. That's her life. And the question is, what do we say to her? Now, there are, will be people who say, don't we already have enough problems? I mean, are, it, you know, why, why do we have any responsibility for Celeste? It's a reasonable question, because we've got lots of problems. Global warming, uh, a, a, a financial crisis throughout many parts of the world. We've got lots of problems, but the interesting thing about the, each of these problems is that education is at the center of each of them. Without an educated population, these problems will simply get worse. All right? So although education is the only solution that we have to deal with, by any means, it is a necessary, though not a sufficient condition, for us to address these problems. And when we come to education, it's not that simple either, because in fact, there are a lot of things we don't agree upon. Whether it's the importance of schools, the importance of technology replace teachers, there's a whole lot of issues that we, that we are, do not agree upon. And the question is, why is it that we are not in more agreement? Why are we not more together about making the kinds of, we're smart people, there are solutions out there, we see those solutions, why aren't we 
working more effectively together to do that. And one of the reasons, I think, is because we are too much in a box. We're not thinking out of the box enough. We're locked into that one box and we're looking for a solution only in that box. And in fact, part of that box says that there's a not enough. It's very common for us to think there's simply there's not enough. There's not enough goods around the world and so we have to scramble for the scarce goods that are there. If, if, if somebody else gets it, we're out of goods. And there's not enough goodness. That Basically, a lot of us think that we are fundamentally just concerned about ourselves, that we're really kind of fundamentally greedy people. And as long as we have that frame of reference when we deal with the issue of that there's not enough goods to go around and there's not enough goodness in us, if that's our frame, we end up playing a game of scarcity where one person or one person or a small group of people get all the goods and the rest of us are broke. And in many respects, that's the world that we live in today in which wealth is so highly concentrated and, very, and the large majority of the people, at least these 1.8 billion children I'm talking about, they get left out. So let's see what happens if we reframe and redefine the crisis, okay? And let's think about it in terms of possibilities. Now, I'm not a pessimist about the future, but I'm not an optimist either. I like to think of myself as a possibilist. I think a lot of things are possible, it will, but it will depend upon us, upon what you do and what the rest of us who are in the position of making change possible do. And so let's look at some of the possibilities. I think there's a possibility that there's enough for all of us if we're just smart enough about how we, if we waste less, if we're smart enough how about with the resources that are there. There's a possibility that there's plenty for all of us. And there's a possibility that under the right conditions we can be good. Now we can all of us be really bad under certain conditions. But if we create the conditions that lead to the best in us, there's a possibility that can happen, just a possibility. So who are we now? The interesting thing is we've learned a lot about who human beings are and we can apply that new learning to the kind of solutions that we create as we go forward. If we look at who we are in terms of our hardwired within that brain of ours, all right, what we know is that there are at least four things that are really essential. For a human being to thrive, we have to have a sense of power, a sense that we're able to do things that we're not helpless. This is a requirement for us to thrive. And you know, there's the old saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's an old saying, you've heard that before. It's only half right. Absolute power does corrupt, absolutely. But power itself can be a very constructive and important thing in our lives if it's well managed and if it's well distributed. Often people think about power as being a kind of a negative thing, you know, and this is often true for women especially, you know, that, that you know, power is not something that is good. But in fact, we need to rethink the role of power and exercise our power, reach out and exercise that power for positive things rather than shy away from having power. In addition, we have a sense of meaning, that we are people who require a sense that what we're doing has some purpose. You're here because you're looking for, you're exercising your sense of looking for meaning in your own lives, okay? That's a core part of who we are. We also, uh, in terms of our, of our own ability as a part, we need to be connected. Isolation is one of the most difficult, one of the most potent powers of, of punishment. You isolate somebody, it's really punishing, all right? So we need an environmental system, we need an educational system that involves connection. And finally, we, it needs to be a sense of fairness. It's very interesting, even with, with chimpanzees. If you, if you starve a chimpanzee, and then you say, in effect, to that chimpanzee, you can have some food if you punish your friend next door. They won't do it. They won't do it, because they say, that's not fair. So they will refuse the food because they do not want to participate in something that is a fundamentally unfair thing. We're human beings that way too. So these four, these four things are really important for any educational system to be built into. If you don't have that, you will not thrive. All right, now the other thing is that the earlier the better this happens. We know that when this happens to very young people that in fact they tend to maintain that sense of themselves and that activity over life. So it turns out that in fact 
the best buy in education is the earlier you invest those money. If you put the money into the earliest years, you get a far better return than at any other level of education, university included, with all due respect to this institution. All right? And so those are the things that we need to think about as we build an educational system, as we change the way education is. And what are the conditions that lead us to be able to create those conditions? Well, first of all is distribution of power. You concentrate power, you don't get good behavior. When you distribute power, you get positive, you get effective solutions, okay? Second is transparency. If there's secrecy in the system, you tend to get bad behavior. So transparency in an educational system, very critically important. First, then mutual accountability. If you're in a situation where you're essentially blaming other people for the problems, then you don't get good solutions. But if you accept your own role, your own responsibility as a part of this problem, and that you have a part of the solution involved in that problem, rather than it being simply externalized, then you get a better, more healthy environment that you're working in. So the bottom line is that we, so does the bottom line, right? <laughs> so the bottom line is that we don't really need to be better people. We need to learn how to create those conditions in our learning environment, in the society as a whole, that it lead us to, be, to have that sense of being able to thrive, by having that sense of empowerment, by, by having meaning, by having connection and fairness in our lives. That is that what, we, what we do, and it's possible. It's possible. It's not inevitable, but it's possible. So what does this have to do with education? I think it's pretty, pretty straightforward. First of all, Education needs to move from that one-to-many, that pyramidal structure that is so common in education today. You have a teacher and you have the learners. We have to move to a many-to-many -many environment. That's what the internet has taught us, that every one of us, including that five-year-old, becomes a teacher as well as a learner. And the teacher becomes a learner as well as a teacher. So that we level and we, we, we in fact look for the resources that each of us and draw the resources out of each of us that we have, regardless of our age, regardless of what we mean bring to the, to the table. Learning is, there are three things that really are critical for human beings. And I, this, I, I love this. The first is we learn something that has already been known. That's a learning process. It's really important, okay? The second is to discover something that has never been known. It's there, but we discover it. it's never been known. The third is to create something that has never existed before. Those are the three things that education ought to be about. Learning things that have been known, that's important to learn. Discovering things that have never been known, so you add to the body of knowledge. And third is to create something brand new that has never existed before. That's who we are. We thrive when we can do all three of those things. The second is to move from exclusion to inclusion. There are too many stop signs in education. Many educational systems are set up so that they're designed to tell virtually everybody at some point that they have failed. They're off the ladder. All right? We need to get rid of the ladder and move from a situation where everyone is learning all the time. It's not something you prepare for life and then you do what you have learned. It's something that is a continuous process throughout life, through all parts of life, not just in schools. And finally, we need to move from one size fits all. That lockstep that, that Miguel was talking about, they're moving toward personalizing to a much more personalized, individualized learning system. All right? Now, it's easy to say these principles, but if we keep them in mind when we're designing, is it leads us to the kind of actions that Miguel has been talking about for Uruguay. That's the kind of direction that we need to move in. So participation, inclusion, personalization, those are the three key things that we need to think about as we refine, as we rechange, and, and Uruguay is actually doing all three of those things. It's really a wonderful example. Now, some simple examples of where it's happening. It's not simply, as, 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 as Miguel has said, it's not simply about simply having a laptop for every child. That's great when you can afford it. But when you're in Nepal with 7 million children and $40 a year as the budget they're spending, we need to have, we can't wait until they can get all laptops. We have to have other things they can do. And here's one example in Ghana where, in fact, creating a public library in a school that the whole village can use 
so that it's an access to the world of knowledge that is available to all of them, using the technology which is to be able to reach an entire village with knowledge, all right? With a solar cell and with offline, it doesn't have to be on, on the internet all the time, that sort of thing. Here in India is, a, is where one room, one teacher, multi-level elementary school, no electricity, where in fact every child maintains their own learning ladder, where they go up their own ladder. If they're gone for two or three weeks, they come back and continue up the ladder. And the teacher is in the role of helping the students help each other learn. There are 12 and a half million in, uh, students in India at elementary level using this system. In Washington, D.C., again, example, where a simple technology for, for, for learning to read, literacy, has moved a class from 10% passing the basic test to almost half of the student in one year, all right? By the use of technology creatively to really help people learn. So these are things that are real possible. But the, the important thing is to make sure that the underlying principles that you're applying are in fact applied. Now, all of this is great. And the, the really missing link, the weak link in all of this is, is pe more people like Miguel. More people who are willing to take the courage, be creative, to really move out. And so we've decided at Open Learning Exchange, it's important to have a way to create, to train more people in each of these countries around the world. We've identified 100 countries and we need, we need hundreds in each of these countries. I say 100,000 entrepreneurs for education like Miguel. I want 100,000 Miguels. I want, I, I want them in every country in the world so that they are creatively creating what they need in their country, what applies to them, what they can do now so we don't lose another generation or two or three of children. Because we can't afford to do that. So that's a very, very key part of this whole process. And some necessities then, we've got to get out of the box. We have to be systemic in our change, so we're not creating these little castles, but we're thinking about how do these things scale throughout an entire country, not just for a few kids. It has to be scalable. There has to be grassroots. It has to be owned and, and treasured by the village itself. It cannot be something imposed from the top down. And it takes time. Easy to bring a new technology and very difficult to make social change, particularly in an established institution like education. So, keep in mind, change is experience is loss. We need to respect the fact that when we're asking educational, when we're asking teachers to change, it's a painful process. It's a painful process, and we need to respect the fact that it is pain. I often say, have a wake, have a funeral for the things you're letting go. Say goodbye to it. Get the people together and have them in together enjoy and understand that they are giving up and, give and, and saying goodbye to something that they have treasured. Have a wake for those things that you're getting. So, so it's important to understand the importance of that loss. It takes courage. Creativity, yes, we need creativity, no question about it. But keep in mind, it takes courage as well to make that change. And this to always just keep in mind that if we don't have the kind of educational system that we're talking about, these problems will simply get bigger and bigger. And so the thing I always like to know, it's not possible to know what is impossible. All right, so don't let anybody ever tell you that this can't be done because they don't know that. All right? And so always keep in mind that it's not possible to know what is possible as well as it's not possible to know what is impossible. And the key for us is to make sure that these kids, when they look at the world and they grow up, have a chance to become a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. For one, I think it's possible. Thank you. <laughs>